Today's chat is brought to you by the support of all our Twitch subscribers. Through the patronage you provide the Focus Fire chat team through the Twitch platform, we are able to provide you with the weekly podcast as well as the website and other aspects of Focus Fire chat. If you have any interest in becoming a subscriber of the FFC and gaining some access to some exclusive features in the Discord server, please be sure to visit our Twitch account and click on the subscribe button. Remember, if you are an Amazon Prime member, that you do have a free subscription to Twitch every month that can be used for this. And for those of you who are already subscribers, thank you again for your generosity. You may have heard the whispers of guardians gathering in the shadows, exploring the mysteries of this world and the worlds which surround us. We are all in search of truth. Sometimes we need to focus that search, focus that fire. And so we come together. Join us. Join the discussion. Welcome to Focused Fire Chat. Welcome back for episode 29 of Extra Lore, recorded live on July 8th, or actually this is August 3rd. Wow, I did not update that. Over on twitch.tv slash focusfirechat. <laughs> As always, I want to give a big shout out to our live chat here with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Our topic for tonight's episode is going to be a look at Warframe. But first, let's run through a quick introduction of those on the show for tonight. As always, this is your host, Blue Crew 86 Next up, we have our own master of social media, the one and only green-eyed music lover. Green, I hope you're doing well. How has the week treated you so far? It's good. It's just a grinding week. And if you Mm -hmm. know what week this is, it is a super, super grinding week. And I am running um, meditations and strikes (laughs) and And adventures and 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 adventures and redux missions. We're going to get that. We're going to get this, this armor shit leveled up guys what, what what's that they they gave us reasons to go do the things that guardians they named. oh go go figure <laughs> um and then that's of course you hear in the, the the background there the super happy beard grizzly i don't just giggles now at i'm that. just like i'm just i don't know i don't know that's your intro now that's your intro now for this one oh great <laughs> i mean at least he's not using the grizzly bear soundbite that's true for your intro. i need to probably do that just set it up just where it's mm. like and then we have and it's like oh there he is <laughs> calm down Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i see what you're doing to me that's fine <laughs> This is why I brought my books with me today. Accept it. This is your fate. Uh, basically. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> man, excuse me. Um, real quick, we did. We do want to call out. Uh, we did not do a question this week simply because uh, the most of us, as, as uh, probably you can figure out, we play Destiny a lot. Um, we don't actually play Warframe. I think between us, we probably all have maybe, maybe oh wow you're yeah. really being generous there um, i mean i've got 14 I okay he's okay. got about two so yeah i'm about i know you played is. a little bit yeah uh, i think i probably played i might have played a little bit more than two i don't know okay. like but that being said though having having done quite a bit of research these last uh this last couple or this last week really as part of the summary um mm-hmm. I have to. I do have to give a big shout out to Warframe. Is my? Um, I'll be completely honest. I am not a fan of the mechanics of playing, but the story itself I found really interesting, um, and actually really enjoyable to to read. Mm-hmm. And I think I know Green. We kind of had numerous discussions about that. Um, but I guess really that's. Uh, I'm not going to ask Beard his opinion. I think probably it's probably best. Yeah, I was about to say, I think okay. that's the safest approach. I th- I think Beard has a lot of um, salty- saltiness, I guess, on the fact all that right, everyone all right, can all right, ask. Yeah, all right, yeah all right. give, you, give, okay. give a defense. Give a defense, yeah. Beard. Like, explain, right. explain this. So part of it comes from my loving community. I love you guys as much as I do, and yes, yes, I very much do. But stop! 
for the love of God, <laughs> telling me to play Warframe because I'm not going to do it. Okay? I don't enjoy the game in in any regard. Uh, I I get migraines and headaches easy to begin with. And the moment that Digital Extreme slows the game down enough that I can actually play it and understand, like, what's going on, I'll be happy. I'll be I'll be understandably happy. But the fact that it moves as quick as it does, the fact I could play Dynasty Warriors and get away without any kind of headaches or migraines or anything like that should tell you how much it bugs me that Warframe gives me headaches and migraines as often as it does. So that's part one. Part two comes down to the uh, story being something that I, in all essence, really just have no care for. Uh, if I've got to be at all honest, I understand which is that really the interesting. With oh, I know, like I, I understand that some of the characters with the like it's a it's a very character driven story mm-hmm. and narrative, and that's the one thing that I will say that I like about it. But I myself am more of like a a background and world building kind of uh, story development kind of person, monster so, hunter. You basically, like I, I like to I like to see that kind of stuff happen and. It's it's not something that I find with Warframe. And even then, Monster Hunter doesn't really, like, it borders on having, like, nothing at all uh, versus, like, Warframe, where, yes, it has some very good lore. There's a lot of very good uh, bits and pieces about the, the organizations that you're fighting against or with, and that needs to be set up. Like, that's typical stuff that I would expect. There's also the universe stuff that I know that they are trying to involve in, but there just isn't enough of it, like, whatsoever. If all of a sudden they turn around and they start to actually improve on some of these world building elements, I'll be all in. Like that's my biggest thing that I think that is stopping me from overall really enjoying the uh, the story of the game. The gameplay of it, I can't get into, and I know for a fact that that is one of the biggest things that is stopping me from enjoying the game that I know so many of you do love. I am not going to tell you at all to like hate the game, to to stop playing the game, or anything like that. But no. I will not be playing the title because they are. It, it is a game that I physically cannot play. Just to stress that again, <laughs> but it is also a title that I unfortunately have zero love for the world or anything, and that's hilarious considering that I absolutely love space, and there's more space for me to go through in Warframe than there is in most other titles that are out there. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is saying that I feel that the uh, the uh, like the the environments that you have in Warframe are at least better built than what like Mass Effect One was, mm-hmm. where Mass Effect One was kind of generic in a lot of realms. But it's not saying much. There's a lot of reused assets that happen, and I think that's another thing that really kind of turns me off to the way the experience is. So just to get my feelings out there on like why my my like couple minute review here of like how everything is put together on like why i just don't really like warframe at all there you go and i don't think that's a bad thing because it's just that's a pretty fair response yeah i think that's a fair i think it's fair i'll still make fun of you for it but that's that's fine you can and i know my community is still gonna make fun of me for it but (laughs) like i i still i still quite frankly just look at them and i go guys i don't like it i don't know how many times and ways to sunday i could tell you i don't like it i'm not gonna talk about it and that's and that's fine i Mm -hmm. there we're gonna talk about it right and there's parts (laughs) of the warframe story that i'm like Okay. Um, well, and I there's parts of I, like, there, there's parts of Destiny's story that were like that too. Right. Like, I, I get oh, yeah, it. Yeah, but totally. Yeah. And I think that's oh, yeah. fair of any story because, well, any story that's this big, it becomes incredibly con- convoluted. Mm-hmm. And it's difficult. Difficult being like the easiest way to, to put it. It's difficult to keep track of everything that's going on because you have multiple characters that you're dealing with multiple storylines you have different races that you're dealing with which i know we're going to get into a tiny bit um blue and i actually had a lot of discussion this week on what exactly we're going to talk about because of how crazy convoluted the story of warframe can be because you've got so many different factions to deal with that Mm -hmm. it becomes kind of a jumbled mess to really try to keep straight in your head it, it's also that, um, if you will, that juxtapositioning as well of like the way that uh, Destiny does 
their factions and how they're placed together, I guess, too. Because the factions or groups that we have are like microcosms of a of a of a larger spectrum mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where they're they're more finite and explained in like a, a more detailed element where you have these large organizations that all of a sudden you don't really know too much about on the on the inside, like other groups or other factions that operate on the inside of them. Like a ball. We've got like how many different like the the siege dancers. We've got the uh, the dust giants. We've got all these different uh, clans that exist within the the cabal of themselves. Not to mention the Red Legion. Uh, but we don't find that with like the the Arokan all that often. We know that there's some dismay between them before getting into it too much. But just to you know throw it out there on like some of the the things that I feel De has some places to improve on with the story. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not like I haven't done my research on this. Like, I wanted to get into this. But it is the simple fact that, like, I... I ugh, I've already I've already gone down this rabbit hole. I'll, I'll shut up. I, I just... It's so hard for me. So hard for me to talk about this. Well, and I think the other, the other thing is, is a lot of people don't feel that way. You know, like, a lot of yep. people really do enjoy the game. And, and I mean, there, there's a number of people who enjoy the the story of it and and it's just in the same regard as you know kind of what you're saying like you're you're not telling people to not enjoy the game but oh, at the yeah. same time for those of us who you know because i'm right there with you as far as the mechanics go I, I i mean like i i gave it a really fair shot i was i was actually looking for a new free-to-play game um mm-hmm. which you know again warframe is uh free-to-play uh, you know, yep. it's like it's which is which is awesome. Like, don't get I mean, oh, yeah. that is amazing that the game of this this quality, regardless of if I am a, a fan of the um, <laughs> the blur, the blur, sh- the blur motions that I am, um, the fact that it's a free to play game is still rather impressive. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, that's like Path of Exile. Path of Exile is another one that's one of those free... It's a free-to-play that's just... It blows me away. And Green, actually, I think, feels the same about Path of Exile that you feel about Warframe. Oh, God, mm-hmm. yes. I can't... I can't do it. Right. I, I mean, but, but... Right. But, I mean, again, it's like... That being said, though, in Path of Exile falls into this camp as well. Well, I, I love it, but, like, the story of it is really, really interesting. Um but I guess that being said, do you want to run through the the intro real quick, and then we can we can jump into what what it is about the story that we find interesting or or don't find interesting? Because <laughs> I'm I'm, can... I'm I'm in I'm I'm game I'm game to listen because I'm I really am curious like because I guess the thing is is like me being you know and beard you and I both have kind of a, a similar uh, experience with science fiction in general. You know, right. like I, I see a lot of um, elements that are are very common to science fiction stories inside right. of this game, and it's done. There, there are tweaks, and this is one of the things that Green and I spent a lot of time talking about. There are tweaks to the that that I actually found rather intriguing, and actually re- uh, almost kind of endeared me to the actual story. Like I'm, I'm actually kind of mm-hmm. curious about how they did the tweaks. So I'm curious as to as to your take on why that's the opposite. If you would, mm-hmm. like, I, I'm curious. I want to. I want to hear your your thoughts on that too. So, yeah. Now I'm going to say I'll I'll let Green kind of roll with it for now because I think having more of an understanding, even for the audience as well, to to kind of get an understanding on like what are these elements that we're kind of alluding to. Uh, mm-hmm. It'll be it'll be important to kind of know that ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, like blue, blue and I typically I, I find any more are more in agreement. So I think it's going to be funny that we're uh, sitting on opposites again. Yeah, yeah. I like well, how we. I like how you and I started on opposites, and now it's like <laughs> Green and I are the opposites of us anymore. Anyway, well, it's all right. I still like you. Yeah, I. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, uh, <laughs> we might have to get back to that one on post show or something. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so let's run through the uh, standard intro real quick, and then we're going to dive right into it. In our last Extra Lore episode, we took a brief look at Star Wars. 
If you ever miss an episode and would like to catch up, please be sure to check out FocusFireChat.com for archives, articles, and links to the other aspects of Focus Fire Chat. If you don't mind, please rate and, if you can, review the show on iTunes, Podbean, or whichever podcasting app you use to enjoy podcasts. Reviews in particular are extremely helpful as they help us show up on charts and that helps others find the FFC community. To those of you who have already taken the time to leave us a review, thank you. As many of you already know, Focus Fire Chat is a cross-community gathering where the intent is to offer a week-long, in-depth view of a particular subject from within the lore of Destiny and other games. With the Extra Lore series, we delve into a game series other than Destiny for a full month, giving the group a chance to get a feel for the other games that our community loves to play. As with the normal chat topics, Extra Lore is decided by the community through a monthly poll. After the month's discussion has come to an end, we get together to stream a high-level summary of the chat for those who were unable to participate. Please be sure to also give some support to the other podcasts in the Guardian Radio Network, links of which can be found on our website. If you're a fan of lore in all its various forms, be sure to also check out thelorenetwork.com where you can find a wide variety of some amazing content that covers a number of different titles and mediums. Extra Lore for August is going to be a discussion on the lore of God of War, so be sure to jump into the Discord server and weigh in. Note that next week we are going to be recording at a slightly different time due to travel schedules of the team, but let us know by weighing in on the poll this weekend on which topic you want to discuss next. Links to that poll can be found on either Twitter, at Focus Fire Chat, or within our Discord server. With all that out of the way, where does everyone think the best place to start is when looking for a really basic understanding of Warframe? Green, I choose you. Uh-huh. It's like the easiest place to start, at least for people who have no idea about anything of Warframe. The I beginning. think the easiest place... Yeah, it's the beginning, like, <laughs> where you should start. I love, I love when I get the opportunity to say that. It's not as often as most people think. It's fairly more often than most people think for you. That's fine. I'll give you that. Well, I think she just called you simple. Yeah. It's once okay. a month. He gets to say it once a month. <laughs> Every time we do this this type of episode. <laughs> Every time we, we get to we do say. the extra lore. <laughs> Uh-huh. Blue gets to it say really, the same words. Uh-huh. Yep, that's why they sound so good, because he's practiced <laughs> them a lot. Um, okay, so <laughs> the easiest place to start is to talk about what are Warframes, and the, how do we get them, where do they come from, and what is this world we're in. Uh, Warframe takes place in kind of a post- post-war it's not really apocalyptic because there wasn't any sort of major event that happened but it does have this immense fill of being after after major events of this war called the old war and the warframes themselves are these highly developed machines that are controlled Oh, by the way, should we just get the spoiler yeah, yeah. alert? Yeah, I was out? going to. I was actually uh, just yeah. about to type that to you, Green. Yeah, uh, Green and I agreed on this before we like. Actually, I think it was earlier yesterday or today. We were typing up the summary of uh, a couple different aspects, and we both realized at the same time, or kind of around the same time, we need to put out an entire episode warning of spoilers because yeah. there is a lot of. But because here's here's the thing. Um, you guys, uh, if you, well, we just said this in the intro, but the three of us have not, we were going to try to get Bife to join us, but because of difference in schedules, we, we, time just zones, yeah, time zones, time zones will kill everybody. Um, but like, so we weren't able to, so, um, the three of us have not played extensively on this game. That being said, we have done quite a bit of discussion with people who have, and we've also done our own, you know, research, of the the storyline in general um which by the way big shout out to warframe community's uh wiki page because mm -hmm. holy moly that thing is well put together um just like at that uh, at the summaries on there are amazingly well done uh so really big and I'll I'll put a link to that in our show notes for sure but so just just a big heads up, uh, we don't want anyone who is currently playing the game and who is really invested in the story itself um, 
to get surprised. So this is the the big warning at the front. We will be discussing things that are going to potentially spoil a lot of the story. Um, if you have not already experienced it, a lot of people don't really usually mind, but you know, for those who do, we try to try to do that courtesy when we can. And this is just going to be one of those ones that we're just going to do a blanket one because <laughs> to be honest, I don't, I, I couldn't tell you what is a spoiler and what's not. Cause I only know what's on the summaries. So, well, and, and that's always and, retroactive. So it's like, right. Uh, well, and in quick addition to that, like the game started as uh, it's in its infancy, the way that it had uh, with with almost no story whatsoever, and then right. they had yeah. to develop and add on to it. And as many will say, I forget now what the expansion is called. Either Rebirth, uh, Re- planes, Re- the planes of Adalon, and then the sacrifice was the most recent yeah. one. Yeah, the this, and my and understanding is. The sacrifice was a very large one, as far as the story story goes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and there was something else that had been previous to that, which I I now forget its name. Unfortunately, oh, well, they because... they had they've had a number of <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they've had a number of hot fixes because again, it's a mm-hmm. it's a free to play game, so there's there's a lot yeah. going on there, um, and and so they've had a number of hot fixes that actually did further progress stories as well. Um, right. And Green Green and I were kind of chatting about this, and I think I think we chatted about. I can't remember if that was in the pre show or if it was actually in the intro. Um, but there is a amazingly well thought out presentation of lore in Warframe. Like mm-hmm. they, uh, they there's this thing called the Sanctuary. Uh, which is basically the um, where this event called synthesis goes on, and it's controlled by a character, which we'll we'll get into it a little bit more in detail. But it's got a character called Cephalon Samaris, and mm-hmm. basically what they do mm-hmm. is the uncovering of lore in Warframe is a community driven event. So like it's through daily, weekly, or I I think maybe even no, I think it's just weekly and daily. Uh, quests that this this character gives different uh, different players, and once the players finish the quest, which is basically uh, explained in game as the synthesis of the being, which is digitizing, it's basically deconstructing a being for data into storage within the sanctuary. Um, they store it within the data oasis that is the sanctuary, and that will in inv- that will in turn uncover in depth lore behind the Warframe universe, and that. Mm-hmm will actually add to because uh, every every character has what's called a personal codex which is basically in game uh, an in game way to uh access basic information about the world as they as you scan it and you experience it and the sanctuary right. offers an even more in depth um codex basically it's a, it's a basically a codex on steroids but i i thought that was absolutely amazing a way to like integrate in the the uncovering of the information in the game i i love that idea like that that was a mm-hmm. i thought I, I just was blown i could not stop reading about that particular aspect of the game i was really kind of i thought it was really a, a unique and really cool way because it basically puts it it puts the the discovery of the story almost completely in the hands of the community and, and the it re- responsibility of it well right right there's that too but i mean like i i just think it it um it inherently makes people invest in the in the story because they're you know they're actively you are actively figuring it out mm-hmm. i think that's just i just think that's awesome um yeah sorry for hijacking no you're okay mm-hmm. Gives uh, me just a second to, to just to point it out. Nameless Praetorian in chat uh, called out the thing I was thinking of. The second dream is basically where things start when you start. To oh look yeah, the, war plan, <clears throat> the which, yeah, 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 and the war within. Yeah, yeah which I admittedly just could not get there. I got to the point where I was like. Headache number twelve on this. I'm putting this down. Goodbye. Yeah, and then and there are also uh, Guardian is is mentioning this as well. There are actually web comics as well um, right. that I are have, really good. Really good. I did. Really I didn't good. get a, I didn't get a chance to read them, which actually makes me sad. But I did get like they were they were mentioned in the summary that I was reading, especially about the Cephalons. Uh, what remains, I believe, is the one that they were referencing, uh, which is talking mm-hmm. about the origin of Cephalons. 
You so also I, I, get more information about the children. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, cool. Let's, let's, uh, okay. So let's jump back real quick. Um, okay. So do you want to do the, the high level summary? Uh, the one that I wrote out. Uh, or, not the timeline. That's more of like the one that I have in the show notes. Oh, okay. Yeah. You go. <laughs> the one that I forward. stole quite inadvertently from Wikipedia because it actually has a really good one. Um, so I'll, I'll make a note where it where I where I quoted them. But basically, in Warframe, you you control members of what is known as the Tenno, which are is a race of ancient warriors who have awoken from centuries of cryo sleep and find themselves at war in a planetary system with different factions. And these are the Grenier, Corpus, Infested. Uh, there's a mention of Orkin and then the Tau or the Sentience. The Tenno use powered Warframes along with powerful weapons and abilities to complete missions throughout the game so as you play there are cinematic missions that you use to uncover stuff and then in from the wikipedia quote the tenno a race of ancient warriors who have awoken from centuries of cryosleep to find themselves at war with the grenier a matriarchal race of military militarized and deteriorated human clones built on built upon metal blood and war the corpus a mega corporation with advanced robotics and laser technology built upon profit the infested disfigured victims of the technocyte virus a reference to dark sector and later the sentience an alien force mechanical beings returning from the tau system after being driven back centuries ago to fight back the tenno use remotely controlled biomechanical suits to channel their unique abilities the eponymous warframes later missions reveal that the warframes are actually biomechanical shells which are connected to the consciousness of the actual tenno human children who were giving un- given unpredictable powers by the void these powers led to them being demonized and they were exiled into stasis pods on the moon. The Tenno and their warframes were used by the Orkin Empire in a desperate fight against the Sentients and stopped their invasion. However, for unknown reasons, the former turned on the latter and caused the Empire to collapse. The Empire shattered with the remnants becoming the Grenier and the Corpus while the Tenno were placed in stasis until centuries later. So that's in quote. I will note that after reading about five different versions of a timeline, there are some errors in that summary, uh, which we will discuss here in a second. Uh, But so and then also to note, uh, we were just kind of talking about releases. Uh, Planes of Edelon was an expansion that was released in November 2017, and it added an open world area to the game. And then uh, The Sacrifice was actually just recently released in June 2018, added a whole other cinematic story, which is actually makes it three cinematic stories to the game. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, so that that's kind of like a really, really high level introductory. You know, it's kind of like the book cover notes of what's going on. Um, Green, do you think it would be better to dive into the timeline or the summaries at this point or sorry not the summaries the factions let me dive into the timeline a tiny bit because each of the factions kind of get introduced right okay okay fair enough fair enough and i think that also will give us a chance to kind of point out some discrepancies from wikipedia hey surprise wikipedia has most of it right but there's some wrong yeah and the only reason and this is i'm going from and again really as far as those of us who have played it it hasn't been much so th- i'm getting my information from stall lord on youtube and mm, Bife. okay and i also went and did like a comparison between wiki and a bunch of other stuff so a lot of this timeline is based off of those people specifically so if i am in error i apologize blame Bife. N- well Bife is actually really surprised flowery and his delivery of it. So he doesn't get into a lot of the nitty gritty, which is totally fine with me because he goes into more of like the emotional um, connotations that come up and you'll see why. Cause there's some really mm-hmm. heart wrenching aspects that happen in some of the different stories, especially with the Tenno. Yeah. God, uh, I'm still upset about it. I don't like, I'm Yeah. I might have, I've might have like vented at green a little bit <laughs> about it. So the easiest way to kind of get an idea of what's going on is not to start at the beginning of where you wake up in the game, because that technically happens way past the 
main actual story of the, well, the developing aspects of the story for the Tenno. So I am just going to read my notes on this one because it's a lot easier than trying to just kind of talk off the cuff. Uh, The story begins when humanity learns of the void and its properties. Because of this knowledge, technology advances at a rapid rate until it becomes what is known as the Orican Empire, which, side note, when you listen to Bife talk about this, he almost says Awoken (laughs) Empire, which immediately got my attention just because of obvious reasons. Orokin. O-R-O-K-I-N. Anyway. The Empire is ruled by seven emperors who are omniscient beings shrouded in mystery. They're also uh, hermetic, if I remember correctly. The highly revered Orican civilization built sovereignty on a culture of art, tech, and architecture. To prove oneself worthy of elevated social status, one must face Orican tri- trials in the golden and majestic halls of ascension. At one time, a utopian society of omniscient leadership, the Orican era ended in a divine realization of their own ignorance. Um, Blue was talking earlier about how they have these lore um, collections, and that's actually from one of those collections. If I'm, mm-hmm. I don't know which one, but that is pulled directly from the game. This empire terraformed much of the solar system, known as the Origin System. So. Mars, Venus, um, I think all the way out to Saturn. I know they, it's Saturn becomes... Yeah, it's basically Sol is what yeah. it is. So society starts to dwindle due to overpopulation, lack of resources, and experimentation on Earth, which causes a lot of um, issues on Earth. Surprise! Yeah. Amongst other things. Scientists called the Archimedeans were charged with finding the solution to the crisis. They had multiple projects to try and solve the issue. One of the projects was dubbed the Crewman Project and is deemed a failure, and and the scientist behind it was sentenced to death. That project specifically, um, I'm trying to remember, it's been a little bit, because I researched this early, earlier, but uh, let's see here. I don't remember exactly what the Crewman project was. Another project was to send out self-replicating machines <laughs> out into the different systems. Cause that's a good idea. Um, well, well, and, and to be fair to interject real quick, the, the idea was a good one. They just turned off fail safes to make it happen, which is well, why it ended badly. Sort of, sort of, and not. Because it actually got so this uh that project in particular where they were going to send out the replicating machines it was actually um not green lighted originally yeah. mm-hmm. it wasn't green lighted until one of the uh Oricon emperor not emperors uh, Emp- uh, yeah uh, the, the emperor. executors ex- executors Execu- there we go right um he actually made sure that they had the flaw and that's in air quotes. That the only reason that the these machines were allowed to go out and terraform Tau was because they had built in this flaw, which would make them weak to the void. Supposedly. Which, yeah, which you have to pass through the void to go out to the Tau because of the, they had void technology to do kind of like essentially slip space where they're going to do actually jump shipping. Uh, to be fair, really, and to interject again, it, it reminds me more of what we see in Warhammer as far yeah. as the way they jump, because they are they're kind of doing the same thing. They're they're basically passing through realities because uh, the void kind of seems like a, an ethereal reality. It's not really here, but it, it's basically the yeah. folding of space time, especially if you start comparing like the the empire and and chaos like, oh yeah 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 yeah. there's there was like i was reading a word rip i was 40K. oh my gosh i was reading it and i was like wow this is making me remember grimdark stuff like yeah mm-hmm. no other kind of <clears throat> made me wish i was just reading more 40k huh <laughs> <laughs> oh man I'm that's sorry, a low that's to. a low point <laughs> are we doing another video on that beard no <laughs> no we're not okay <laughs> so these uh, sentient uh, machines, these self-replicating machines, get sent out to Tau, and we don't hear from them for a while. 
So they, the Oricon decide to start sending out colony ships to help try to speed up the process and to help make sure everything's going okay. One of these ships was the Zaramon 10 Zero. This ship was, that was sent out to start terraforming Tau against protocol, children were also on board amongst the crew. So they weren't supposed to have kids with them, but they totally did. The did void they, jump. Did they smuggle the kids on or did they put them on? I never got that clear. Like I didn't get it clarified either. I know it was against protocol, so I imagine they probably smuggled them on because okay. it was families. That's right. Family that's right. Units. Because yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, it's not like they brought them on to experiment on right, them right, right. or anything like that. It was a lot more innocent than that. So they, let's yep, see, they na- brought them nameless on. and nameless and chats already already mentioned it. Yeah. So yeah. It makes me well, so annoyed. But okay, sorry. Go yeah. go for it. Brie. I think it's fine. No, it's, fine, it's not. But... It's not. It's 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 why. It's why they no, go. It just yeah. you know more about why they they name them. That's more than I do. So I'm just going to continue on the little yes. story. Void jump between Saturn and the Tau system actually becomes kind of a failure, and they get stuck in the void. Now the void is not like <clears throat> it is, and it isn't like the void in Destiny. It is a very strange things don't happen the way that you think they would imagine the easiest... imagine the hellscape that nightcrawler goes through yeah that's a really good way to put it i was also thinking kind of the last episode of firefly how the mm. reavers and everything mm. that's how i kind of viewed it especially with the scene that is described on the ship once they're in there for a while because they get to the point where they have no extra rations um and that's they're point, out of yeah. everything they're going crazy essentially and all the adults have turned into these kind of rabid hunting packs going through the lower levels of the ship hunting each other um cannibalizing each other getting rid of each other and there's a pocket of children on the upper levels singing and playing and kind of doing their own thing that were unaffected to an extent by the void in the same way that the adults were. The adults were kind of driven mad. The children were not. Um, Let's see here. So due to the effects of the void, the adults became mad and start sabotaging the ship. The children were unaffected and some decide to hunt the various adults down. One child named Rel, which you learn that in the comics, um, who was considered an outcast because of his autism room the ship alone and he develops sensitivities to the void and gains a greater understanding of its properties so rel is kind of a higher higher level character and they do Mm -hmm. a really good job of showing the autism a different level of autism than what is most i guess visually represented in Mm -hmm. pop culture so that was something that stood out to me Eventually, the ship kind of warps out of the void, and it's just discovered that the children have developed these volatile powers. Um, they're not able to control them, really. They just kind of... It's just like when you develop powers for the first time, and you have no idea how to, to make it not be so terrible. Yeah, pretty much any, people, any right? superhero movie out there. Right. Uh, because of these powers, the Orican, the Empire itself, becomes kind of fearful of the children. And they're they're doing like all these different tests and they basically want to get rid of them or like out turn them into outcasts to just get them out of there because they're kind of scared because they don't understand it. One of the Archimedians, though, takes pity on them and her name is Margulis. Margulis felt compassion and adopted the children as her own. She was eventually blinded. Because they were still, like, they still really didn't understand their power. She was blinded by them, but still persisted. And she developed a stasis pod in which the children could have their void sensitivities dampened, thus giving them the time they need to refine and control their ability. So they basically put them into this stasis pod in order to help prevent them from causing issues themselves to themselves and to everybody else because void powers are scary and hard to understand and super powerful and incredibly powerful so that leads us to the sentience coming back in the beginning of the old war 
Mm-hmm. So those self-replicating machines come back. Somehow they weren't supposed to be able to because you, in order to get from Tau to hmm. the origin that flaw system, is not working out so well. Let's just put it that have, way. Yeah, they have to slip through the void, mm. and they manage to slip through the void, and they are creepy, angel, red angely wing machine. <clears throat> they're kind of creepy looking. Well, and it makes it to a degree. It makes sense why they're like. Yeah, it makes they they basically the reason why the sentient. Uh, come back actually you find out is <clears throat> is because they they made it to tau and they started doing what they were basically programmed to do but one of the things that happened was they actually originally weren't designed with sentience like they, they didn't they didn't have that when they were mm-hmm. sent it was actually an effect belief i think the common belief of the community right now is that it was an effect of the void actually on them and so they they kind of develop the sentient this level of sentience, and then they start realizing that the sento, uh sorry sentience start really there's another ra- there's another unit called the sentinel that I always get this confused with and they're not the same mm-hmm. um, the sentience start realizing that the orican had sent them out to Tau to do what they did to the origin system to the Tau system which is basically destroy it. Because they view the Orkin as basically squan, like, you know, they, they've destroyed the origin system to a degree. That's the whole problem is they're, they're overpopulating. They're, you know, doing all these experiments and all this stuff. And so the, the sentient, sentients have a problem with that. They're, they have been basically kind of um, programmed with, you know, terraforming and, and to a degree protecting the Tau system. So that twists into a sense of, well, we have to protect the Tau system from the orkin and so Mm -hmm. they come back in order to wage war to protect the tau system from becoming basically another origin system um and so it's it's a really interesting actually uh like i said it's it's a very classic hey we've made the supercomputer and now the supercomputer is like in order to protect the earth you know we have to destroy humanity it's it's very skynet ish Um, what's funny is that they the the whole warframe franchise is has different factions that kind of play different oh, riffs on oh that my same thing. Gosh, it's so yeah, like oh yeah, you know, really. I think yeah, it really does. Like all of them, and, and this was another thing that you start realizing when you start looking at all the factions. All of them have beef with the Orican, and right, and that translates into so. This kind of goes back into why a lot of these individuals are antagonistic towards the Tenno, um, which so we kind of have been talking around this this little nugget of information. Um, the Tenno's name. So Tenno is actually a Japanese word that actually means I believe it's divine emperor. Um, but in Warframe, the way that they got their name was the ship that it was on was Zeraman Ten Zero. So anyone who kind of probably has already figured this out, if you shorten that, it's ten zero, it's ten o. So the Orkin literally, they were they had gotten so unnerved by these children that came back that they literally just referred to them in a group as the Tenno. Um, and let me see where I put that note because it is it's really actually it really bugs me to be honest. Uh, where did I throw the reason that, that they're called the Tenno? No, well, like the or... implication, the implications of what it is. Um, mm. Yeah, here it is. <clears throat> so upon, so yeah, the player character of the game is the Tenno. Uh, Japanese translation of Tenno is Divine Emperor. So upon shortening Ten Zero into Ten O and making it easier to pronounce, combining the syllables into one word, Tenno, it becomes even more plainly visible that the Orican, as a society, were unnerved by the children who had been found on the ship. They wish to maintain such a clinical attitude towards the children that they simply name them as a group after the very ship that they were found on. They don't ever refer to them as individual children. They only refer to them as Tenno. And you can see this in the way that Tenno, the word Tenno, is both a singular and plural. Whenever you talk about the Tenno, you could be talking about a group of the children or you could be talking about a child. But it is never said the children. It is always referred to as they are always referred to as the Tenno. Mm-hmm. Um, and and to me, that is just it, it's a dehumanization process. Uh, it's a very common psychological trick, 
that uh, let's try to put a tactful way of that less desirable experiments that in, in our own history have been performed with that exact practice. They are not people. They are, you know, the other. It, it, it basically dehumanizes to a point that there is no uh, empathy capable of of that individual. Um, and And remember, again, you're talking about children. You're not talking about adults who have gone through, you know, a, a life or whatever. No, you're talking about kids. And these are kids that have gone through, I mean, literal hell and back. And they get back, they make it all the way back home. And yeah, I mean, it, it, that just like as, as, as a human being and as a parent, especially that just like really, really strikes me and, you know, makes me really kind of not angry it, not yeah I, I, angry would be the best word it's a very like you you guys were kind of commenting on like the emotional like pit of your stomach kind of feeling that is one of them um mm-hmm. for me especially like i was like you know it's one thing I, I, this is a weird statement uh so bear with it it's one thing to dehumanize a fully grown human like it, it's it's you know it's not okay it's never acceptable but it's one thing to do that to like a, a 25, 30 year old who's who's lived a reasonable life, you know, reasonably full life. Um, again, never is it OK. But to say to do that to like, you know, an eight year old, like that's just to me, that's that's a line that, you know, just personally, I find very hard to stomach. Yeah. Um, but yes, and so there's there's that there's that component. It's a very it's a very dark component to the entire story, and it kind of it it also does a very good job of pulling back the the veneer of this Orkin Empire. You know, this empire of gilded golden age. You know, uh, marvelous tech and all this stuff, and kind of revealing that even at their heart, they are kind of xenophobic, which is really important because that kind of translates into a couple of their creations, uh, which is something that you kind of see within the old war. Mm-hmm. And that's where the, so the sentients come back um, from the Tau system and they basically, they come back and they just start wrecking havoc on, on the Orkin. Like they just, because there's, because like I said, like I was kind of joking, the flaw is not such a flaw. It doesn't exist really. And, and you have to remember that most of the technology at the time was based off of the void. Yes. And so Which, they, yes. they weren't weak to. They <sighs> developed a immunity to it, essentially. The sentient did. Correct. And um and so this is so yeah, again, they come back, they seek they're seeking revenge on the Orkin. And this is you know, as Green was saying, this is the beginning of the old war. And the war was originally very heavily in the favor of the sentience. Um, and, and to a degree, the, the sentience were actually able to basically become immortal when it comes to go, doing battle against the Orkin because of exactly what Green was just saying. Uh, however, the saving grace was actually in the form of a complete accident when one of the, I believe it was a clone at that point, um, or no, he wasn't a clone. No, he was just he a low, a he was a low cast. He was just like a soldier or something. Uh, he accidentally discovers that the sentient are weak against archaic weapons, which are basically like slug rifles, like, you know, modern, like our modern day weaponry. Mm -hmm. Um, Now this, this member, the way that the Orican kind of rewarded him for basically saving their hides is they had a slave population of cloned, thing cloned units uh, again orkin are really good at dehumanizing things that they called the grenier and the grenier slaves were basically therefore from that point forward they were all basically cloned off this one individual which you know anyone with he's, a, a, he's a, not attractive either well well yeah. and also also the <laughs> Anyone with Not a, a modicum with anyone with a modicum of biological understanding can realize this happened hundreds, if not thousands, of years ago, and they've been cloned off one guy. Just, just bear bear that thought for a mind. There's a lot of things wrong with these people. Um, like the Grenier are all sorts of jacked they have, up. Plus, they have a bunch of uh, 
mechanical modifications that are well and that's in order to extend the life right because without those without the cybernetic modifications they were they have a lifespan that is like significantly lower than normal they're not they they're they're pretty much dead on arrival as far as like when they when they are created um they do not live very long and so they they basically bootstrap cybernetic parts to themselves in order to even have a a a decent length of uh existence but that's that's kind of getting ahead a little bit because the grenier haven't kind of taken on uh they have not become as powerful as they are within the game that most people experience they're not very they're not as new well they're as numerous but they're not as organized i guess you would say um and they're definitely not their own culture at this point but so basically once it was discovered that the archaic weapons, you know, actually had a uh, a bit of it allowed them to take a bit of ground back against the sentience, the Orkin realized, oh, hey, this is an idea. Let's start playing with this. And they start actually um, beginning to push the sentience back. And then, you know, again, the Orkin are really, really good at doing experiments. They are always doing experiments to try to rectify situations and one of these experiments is with the Tenno. And this kind of dovetails into another project that's called the Tenocyte uh, Super Soldier Experimentation. And in this uh, Super Soldier Experimentation, you know, this makes me feel like I'm talking about Captain America a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, they were trying to create Super Soldiers. It's a very common, you know, trope there. But it wasn't going well. Like they they could not get the people to survive. They were just they just kept getting basically eaten by this this technocyte virus that they were creating. Um and and they created what was basically called a golem, uh, which is exactly kind of what it sounds like. It's like a it's like a, a homunculus, basically. Um mm-hmm. as a result, they kind of i can't remember exactly how it happens but basically it accidentally comes out that the tenno are able to to basically connect in a way with the golems and the they're actually able to control them uh, with a process called transference and this transference is a manifest or is a particular manifestation of one of the void powers that they gained from their entire you know field trip that I don't really know how else to explain that event. Right, it I makes know. me think it makes me think of a demented um magic school bus. But um oh. I mean seriously it does. But uh so that gives a whole new meaning to Ms. Frizzle. <laughs> Today class Um Mm-mm. I was oh, more man. so just going with the name, but uh carry on. Right, right. Uh, so basically, once they once they discover once the Orkin uh, executor, executors uh, and the gosh, what is I just blanked on the scientist name. The Arc Archimedians. 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 Once they kind of discover this this facet about the Tenno, they just like pour all these resources into making what's basically called Warframes. They're basically golems that are remote controlled by these these kids. And then they start training them. Uh, they start training them in the use of gun and blade, which are the you know archaic weapons. And these these warframes just start completely wrecking havoc. Um, however, to note, this was all against the wishes of Margulis. Uh, the Orkin leaders basically came to Margulis, who remember had basically adopted all the Tenno, uh, and they were under her protection as well as her charge. And they pressed her to allow them to make them into basically the weapons of war. And Margulis not only refused, she actually went as far as to denounce the Empire, which was a huge slap to the face of the Orkins. Because um, as uh, Gamertron in chat is actually pointing out, the Orkin believe themselves to be gods, especially the ex- mm-hmm. the executors and the, the Archimedians and the emperors. They all believe themselves to be infallible. Uh, So when Margulis denounced them and, you know, kind of pointed out that their plans are flawed and they were, you know, not not on the up and up. Well, they did what any great regime who's losing control does, and they 
killed her. Um, they executed her and did what they wanted to do anyways with the Tenno. So the Tenno are put into field um, with their newly acquired Warframes, and they lead the charge, basically, and drive the sentients back. And they actually fully turn the tide. Uh, they mm-hmm. completely, just completely start decimating the sentients. And to be honest, this would have uh, this would have been the end. Like, this would have been the end of the sentients, the end of the story, except there's a, there's a betrayal. Uh, one of the Orokin are uh, betrayed by a or an Orokin. I believe he was an Archimedean. I may be incorrect on that. That's off the top of my head. But who goes by the name Ballas? Um, and Ballas uh, lost, I believe, his wife. I think was who it was. Uh, the, his wife was killed. So his the close figure, I believe, it's his wife, was killed in one of the uh, I guess experiments or something that happened. And he blames the Orokin basically. And so he betrays the entire Orokin uh, race to the sentients. And because of this betrayal, they are, uh, the sentients are able to not only kind of stop the turn. Um, <laughs> sorry, chat. Um, who are, they're not only able to kind of stem the tide of the Warframes, they're actually able to start turning it back. And that's where it kind of gets into... Um, Actually, the 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 nod that one of the DLCs, the Plains of Adalon, actually are. Uh, so basically, it's after this betrayal um, that the purge of the Orkin kind of is result of, uh, and it's a self destructive purge. There's basically a large um, a, a pushback against the Sentinels that result in not only the purge of the Orkin, but also the, the majority of the sentient force, sorry, the Sentinels, sentience, the sentient forces are being driven back to the Tau system. Um, and as, as a result, the, the Tenno are adopted and they are kind of put on ice as it were. They go into hiding by their new custodian, the Lotus, who is a figure who is in the game that we, we play she is one of the main story drivers um, this is when she comes into the picture. Um, but however, as a part of this, as, as the, as the sentients are being pushed back, there is a, a single sentient, one massive sentient that actually manages to land on earth. And this, this creature or this entity just basically lays waste to the entire planet, except for one tower, one city and one tower. And that was the tower of Unum. And, the tower's defense is held firm because of the help of its people and because a single Tenno stayed, and this Tenno was Gara, uh, and she stayed to help defend the tower while the Tenno had been scattered. And the the odd thing about this particular sentient was that it its power waxed and waned with the du- the dusk and the dawn. So basically, it became strong when night came, and it became weak when the day came. Um, and Gara basically took that as an opportunity to, to search for it during the day. Uh, but it would, the, the Unum had basically forbidden her from fighting the sentient when it was at the height of its power, because they didn't want to lose her because she was basically the, 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 you know, linchpin that was keeping them safe. So anyways, what they did was in order to appease her, they allowed her to enhance, uh, her followers or basically her, her, I don't want to call them servants, but the people who were following her. Um, and then they fed a, a elixir called Kuva, which is another kind of item that I th- we might get into later, but it, anyways, <clears throat> they fed it to the local wildlife, uh, which then inadvertently or not inadvertently, but then connected that wildlife to her as a Tenno. She was able to tap into this basically development of a natural network of spies and she was able to use that to actually backtrack uh she basically used that to backtrack the sentient's uh refuge and so she was able to locate them through that however the problem was is that at the same time she was using it the sentient was able to tap into it as well and then could uh then it recognized that kuva which is something very important um sorry chat gara's entourage um the, oh yeah. The the sentient realized Aquaman uh, on crack. Oh my gosh, it's yeah. Um it realized that Kuva actually could 
not only heal it, but it could actually replace its ability to replicate. Because one of the things that the Technocyte had done, so this Technocyte was um, an infestation, which again is another faction that we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, the Orkin created a basically a, a virus warfare, and they unleashed it on the sentience. And that uh, what it did was it drove the ability for them to replicate or to you know heal themselves. It neutralized that. So this sentient realized that Kuva could restore that ability, and so basically it just went full force. You know, it just went all out on its attacks. So during one of these during one of these final attacks, Gara actually rose and took a bomb and basically pulled a Master Chief and ran into its core. And on her as as she dies. She sets off the bomb, which completely destroys the sentient. Well, what happened is all of that, all of that damage, all of those, um, all of that shrapnel that was from the sentient. Well, it didn't. They didn't lose their their drive. I guess they lost the the organize, organization of its thought. But basically, what happens is they became what are known as the Idolons. Uh, and so when the planes of Eidolon, which again was that November 2017 DLC, that, that was actually a testament to the final battle between that last sentient and Gara. Uh, so all the wreckage that are the fossilized wreckage that litters the planes are infused with that sentient's powers, that dark, those dark powers. And that's why they wax and wane with the, the uh, darkness and the dawn. Um, and that's also where you get the explanation of an in-game or an in-game explanation of the mechanics of that particular open world aspect changing because those Eidolons are now mindless fragments of that, that sentient and they're just wandering in this endless search for completeness. They're basically looking for each other and they, as they do, they are, you know, falling apart, they're destroying different things. And so they're littering the landscape with all these random potent and unique resources that the Tenno now in game are able to go and collect so that kind of brings us to the end of the old war um which i understand is actually it's not a short explanation but it it sets it up really to explain all the different factions um which we've kind of actually we'll start we'll kind of go back we've actually touched on most of them um Mm -hmm. Though I do, I do like your note here too about following the conclusion that Tenno developed the various schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, real quick on that, uh, this is another. I, I will give Warframe this; they do a really good job of using in-game lore to explain game mechanics like really well. Uh, Tenno schools are basically a; they represent different different paths of discipline in regards to the Tenno's personality and fighting styles that manifest in the various abilities that each school provides. Uh, basically, from a mechanic standpoint, each school has its own skill tree, and it comprised of ten abilities, which they call ways, which are I believe they're active, passive, and then I can't remember the last one. There's a third one. Um, there's a different. There's three different types of waves. Uh, And all of these unlock various passive abilities that can enhance operator powers and, to a lesser extent, grant improvements to player's Warframe, i.e., this is how you level up. Um, And so there are, let me see, five schools. There are Technically, I think there's more than five, but there's some schools that they don't know what. Oh, okay. So some of them have been like lost, basically. Sort of, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> sorry chat um the the first one that so the there's there's naraman zinark zinaruk uh green you jumped in front of me vazarin mandarai and unaru uh mandarai is the school of fighters uh and there's there's some really cool little lore tidbits within each one of these and i'm not going to dive into them just yet but there's Mandarai, which is School of Fighters, Vazarin, which is the School of Protectors, Nam- Naraman, which is the School of Tacticians, uh, Unaru is the School of the Indomitable, and Zinaruk, which is School of the Arcane. And each one of these schools is, is focused on a different aspect of gameplay, which then allows you to, as a player or an operator, um, allows you to level up and enhance your, ten- your Warframe in different manners. 
which actually brings me to the faction of the Warframes, uh, the Tenno. <clears throat> um, so the Tenno, real quick, as a player, again, big nod to the way that they explain this in, in game. Um, the Tenno actually, or the Warframes, are actually exactly that. They are proxy frames for the Tenno. Uh, and so as such, actually, I believe it was in the sacrifice, it was confirmed that one Tenno, one operator, is actually capable of operating various different Tenno, or different, God, I keep calling them Tenno's, different Warframes. Uh, up until that point, it was assumed that was the case. It was kind of implied, but we didn't. they didn't have any confirmation from the developers. And so the sacrifice, actually, I believe, was the, the confirmation of that factoid. <clears throat> Um, so Warframes, which are deri- the term is derived from the Orkin war- word for war platform, is an advanced weapon system that's used exclusively by the Tenno in their missions throughout the Origin system. And these Warframes possess, possess regenerative shields, greatly enhance mobility, and enable the use of an array of supernatural abilities, all of which further augment the Tenno's deadly use of traditional combat arts. And that kind of goes back to the origin of the, that, that symbiotic relationship. The combat, the combat abilities provided by Warframes are vastly superior to both the Corpus high technology and the Grenier's vast number. Even the most inexperienced Tenno can fight their way through hordes of basic foot soldiers alone, and teams of experienced Tenno can best even the deadliest enemy threats. Note here that each model of Warframes are personifications of a great warrior spirit. For example, the Exc- Excalibur model, which um, we'll talk about here in just a second, grants its controller enhanced prowess with bladed weapons. However, while certain models excel in a particular situation, they are not limited to a singular role. There are significantly enhanced models, which are known as Prime Warframes, and that just indicates that the unit was actually made with Orkin technology instead of simply being based off Orkin design and made with lesser technology. Um, and actually, most of this is actually explained from the Excalibur Codex entry, which is an in-game uh, lore entry. And it says, we hear, we hear of the origin from the Warframe archives, or sorry, I'm, I'm saying this, we hear from the origin from the Warframe archives. Um, and it says, quote, the sentience had won. They had turned our weapons, our technology against us. The more advanced we became, the greater our losses. The war was over unless we found a new way. In our desperation, we turned to the void. The blinding night, the hellscape where our science and reason failed. We took the twisted few that had returned from that place. We built a frame around them, a conduit of their affliction. Gave them the weapons of the old ways, gun and blade. A new warrior, a new code was born. These rejects, these tenno, became our saviors. Warrior gods cast in steel and fury, striking our enemies in a way that they could never comprehend. Excalibur was the first. And that's the end of that codex entry. So, again, kind of touching back on that old war, that invention of the Tenno, and it's kind of like the the wounded healer, you know, it's it's this this reject is coming to coming to fruition and coming into the power of being able to protect it or to protect the society that had actually been their their source of outcasts. They had been exiled from this society. Um, And so. Yeah, and that's and that's really the Tenno. And so the thing to remember about the Tenno in game currently is that they are emerging into a world that's actually very unfamiliar to them. Um, they are descendants of the civilization of lost warriors from the Orkin era, uh, and and they've been preserved in cryopods for centuries. Uh, so yes. the Tenno are now awakening, and they are you know they're doing what that comes naturally to them, which is fighting and resisting all these different factions. And they're- a lot of no, go for it. Go for it. They're, they're kind of being sort of hunted there I, yeah. because of because of their connection because of, to the Oricon. Because they are well, Oricon. That and that and the fact that they're so powerful. So you have to right. remember all these different factions are searching for tools to become more powerful themselves. Especially the Corpus. Right. Um, which did you mention that the Corpus were like a merchant the- originally? Kind of. uh, not yet. I'm going to get to it in just a second because that's actually the segue I was going to jump onto the corpus from the Tenno because it's because one of the other quotes is from the mem- while the memories of the Tenno have faded over time, their mastery of guns, blades, and warframe exo armor have not. 
Um, and so one sees like this noble warrior building a strength against an oppressive regime. And w- another one sees an opportunity mercenary exploiting the war for warframe superiority for self or for wealth. Um, so basically all the Tenno are waking up and every single Tenno is actually individuals. They all have their own, you know, drive, they own their own plan and their own intent of what they are going to do now that they've been awoken. However, no matter what, they are loyal to each other. Like they, they basically, they will protect another Tenno regardless of, you know, if they have a disagreement with that Tenno, it does seem that if that Tenno is put in threat by another faction, all Tenno's band together. It's like a very big uh, family, you know, all the siblings pick on each other, but the in- instance that an outside force comes in, everyone bands together and kind of pushes that outside force back. You know, it's the whole, I'm allowed to make fun of my younger brother, but you're not mentality, Um, which actually does lead us into the corpus, uh, which green kind of made it mentioned here. The corpus basically are a merchant cult. Uh, They're built on the foundation of salvage technology and robotics. And these are the scavengers of the outer systems. And one of the reasons that they are really focused or they really focus on the Tenno and their warframe is because they are really greedy for that old world, old war salvage. They, they think that it's going to give them it's, that's the biggest bang for their buck. So um, they're the fallen. Kind We've of. had they, the Vex. And, and to now be we have fair, the, or I guess Siva. Now yeah. To be fallen. fair, that's a very accurate thing because the thing is, is so the synthesis that I had mentioned uh, one of the synthesis revealed that the corpus originated from Oricans. So you'll start noticing that a lot of these things are connected back to Oricans. Actually, everything is connected back to the Oricans. But mm-hmm. the corpus actually originated within the Oricon society. And they descend, And as they descended over time, they fell. They, they became fallen Oricon. And they became these scavengers that, you know, that was the way they survived. Um it also explains why in game, if you run into a corpus, they all like pretty much one of the base insults against the Tenno are quote betrayer. They view the Tenno as betrayers of their way of life because the Tenno to their minds, they abandoned them. They betrayed them. Um, and so they're, they're a very pl- plutocratic conglomeration of commercial and industrial interests. And it's basically they're unified through a single trade language. Um, now, an interesting thing about the Corpus is that the Corpus is actually the only faction in Warframe other than the Tenno that speak English or that are capable of speaking English. And this was actually an update, I believe, rather recently. They The Grenier used to speak English in game, but they've actually updated it so the Grenier don't really speak English. They speak this kind of like slurred version of it. But the Corpus is actually able to communicate in in, in, in very clear English. Uh, their language is actually a uh, Roman num- Roman number like alphabet, uh, and it's very similar to conventional English, which is really interesting because if you look at the Orican language, the Orican language was like really super Elvish, I guess, like a Tolkien s Tolkien ish Elvish script, um, and so it's kind of interesting that it's kind of converted back into <laughs> into the conventional you know realm of English speaking. Um, let's see, speaking, well, actually speaking of that, so the Grenier jumping over to them, uh, mm-hmm. the, the in-game description of the Grenier, I think speaks volumes, it says, quote, the Grenier swallowing colonies whole, their clones flood the system from a hidden toxic womb. The twin Queens, the sisters have sent their most beloved commanders on an urgent mission to protect the twisted crusade that they have begun to transform the scattered colonies into an empire to see that the Tenno, hidden and asleep, will never awaken. And that's... Speaking like of a uh, the Grenier, it is actually a Grenier who is bucking against the Twin Queens, who actually wake us up initially. Yes. Well, was that who woke us up, or did we... I thought the Lotus activated you to defend you against the Grenier commander. Well, the Grenier commander is trying to wake up the Tenno, even though he's not necessarily supposed to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Because he, he's trying to prove something. Anyway, Grenier, creepy, xenophobic. Twin queens are terribly, terribly odd. Um, one is... Who are Oregon. 
actually. Yes, they are. And one of them becomes infected at one point, right? Or I believe one of them so. Loses... Well, they both are kind of, both of them are kind of insane, obviously. Well, yeah. uh, one of them is kind of young looking and the other one mm-hmm. not so much. I can't remember the difference, the, the different names, but one of them is the, is obvious, is like the older one is um, the one that is like in control most of the time. And then the younger one is the one that's like pushing, uh, she like, man, I, I, my understanding was like, she manages like the minor things while the old one like manages the big picture stuff. Mm. Um, but basically Grenier are, they, they're, they're basically the ultimate xenophobes. Uh, this is, and this is fueled by hereditary madness. And so like, I, like we had said earlier, they are all clones. Uh, they're all clones of a single person as well. Captain Vor, thank you, Gamertron. Uh, Captain Vor is the character that I believe is the, the first Grenier commander you meet. Um, so as such, they're products of this like half remembered Orkin technology. Uh, it's basically they, they're cloned and no one really remembers how or you know why it works. It just does. And so they don't really know how to make it better. So each Grenier that is cloned has its own like genetic defect that varies from degree to or from from Grenier to Grenier. Um, and this defect stems from the original design by their creators, the Orkin that was basically put into the design in order to ensure obedience. Uh, But because of the invasive cloning procedures that are used to create and birth each generation over the centuries, this has basically further damaged the genetic information, which has basically enhanced all of that. Um, So as such, and we kind of were talking about this a little bit earlier, as such, the Grenier have a life cycle that is limited to only a fraction of what would be considered normal. And and to and on top of that, they're host to like a, just a huge number of degenerative disorders, uh, such as like decaying limbs and skin, uh, a reduced intelligence, etc. And this is where you see the Grenier kind of revealing their really scary pragmatism um, and their like really roughshod use of technology, because the way they compensate for all these degenerative issues is through the widespread use of really crude cybernetic prosthetics and augmentation. Um, and basically the, the developers kind of point out that this is a reflection of the overall crude, but undeniably effective technology that they implement in all facets of their lives. Uh, they basically just ratchet things back together and, you know, they're falling up, part but they're keep they keep repairing themselves but it's just it's really weird the green air are creepy frankly a lot of the races are creepy well uh, like the corpus the the corpus like i kind of get the corpus well okay yeah they're they're like okay i will give you that they are they're the they're the weird robot things but the corpus like makes sense like the corpus like their their whole drive makes sense the grenier just yeah I mean, the the corpus make about as much sense as the Ferengi do in Star Trek, to be honest. Well, like okay, they're, that's they're driven true. almost completely by by business and right, and wealth, right, etc. Speaking so, of which, per side, per that point, <laughs> did you did you guys see the Reddit post of the corpus dog that does tippy taps? Oh God, no! So there is a robotic dog that is doing like little tippy taps. Cause if you follow tippy tap uh, Reddit, like I do like a child, um, it's tippy tapping <laughs> at another dog who is just so angry that this thing is even there, but it looks like one of the corpus. Anyway, moving on side <laughs> note. <laughs> and we uncover yet another facet of green's personality. I like tippy taps it's fine it's it's like something that is infesting you no 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 not gonna let me do that one no okay well anyways we'll talk about the infested um so the flood kind uh, a little kind kind of they're they're based off of let's be honest I mean, here for they just kind a of are they kind of are they're i mean yeah. with the with the slight deviation that it's techno organic yes. instead of just organic they're siva they're siva in some ways except for that it's not controlled like a no i mean like i definitely well, agree exactly. with, I like agree with beard it's it's very flood like because they have the high they're, 
they're right. a little bit more or, or a lot less organized than what Siva is. But yes, they're the instead of the flood being organic, you've got the uh, techno where, where the flood is organic, the infested is more techno related. Like that's the the whole flip flop switch, if you will, <laughs> between it all. And and it's fine. But I'm just pointing it out, just for clarity's <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. sake. Like, yeah. this has been done right. about 20 million times before. So, the in-game description of the infested is, Infestation describes both the disease and its victims, a metamorphic affliction without cure. Living organisms hmm. are consumed and merged into rabid amalgamations. Individuals are violent and animalistic, yet the larger whole exhibits signs of coordination, with multiple swarms converging on ships and colonies. Its Weavers. origins are... Yeah, its origins are uncertain, but there is a historic there is historical evidence of similar outbreak before the collapse. And that's the end of that that codex entry. Um, so yes, again, very very flood like. So I, and for reference, I have no idea what made me like chime in all of a sudden on these guys in particular. But <laughs> no, no, I mean like just, as uh, as I was I've... writing this this uh, this summary of them. It's like, yeah, it, it's now there is a caveat that in the sacrifice DLC, uh, they kind of actually um, reveal Well, they do. They reveal that original Warframes were actually Orkin men and women who had been infected with a unique strain of the infestation. Um, and that that in infe- that infestation not only reshaped their physical bodies, uh, which actually is where you get the the. Um, biomechanical aspect of warframes because there's there's actual bodies inside the warframes um Mm -hmm. but they also granted them safety from the infested madness uh and so basically what this does is the tenno are controlling the warframes and the warframes are actually immune to the technocyte insanity which is which is why the infested really don't like the warframes they're they're very unnerved about them um and so basically uh this is is this also kind of confirmed by the lotus uh during a quest i think it's called the glass gambit quest that the entire that entire fear that the infested have towards those hybrids which is what they refer to as the warframes is that combination of infestation with other forces such as void powers um such as these hybrids will actually become immune to the infestation which is the hive mind connection um, right. So, so that goes back to you know what are the infested? Basically, the majority of the infested are corpus and grenier units that have been taken over by uh, techno organic parasites, which are the technocytes of the biome- biomechanical pathogen used by the orican, the infestation. Uh, basically, they do tend to be of all the units. They tend to be a lot of corpus crewmen and lancers. I think that may be where the crewmen experiment green. Is I'm that... not sure. I can't give you an exact. Okay. On it, okay. I, might, I just, I just, I just thought about that. That might be where the corpus kind of connect not more sure. securely. But anyways, um, the, so the, the interesting thing here is that the oldest of the infested, which are referred to as the ancients are creatures who were overtaken by the plague so long ago that they are actually no longer recognizable. Um, they they believe there are, there are many who believe that these creatures could actually even date back to the old world itself. Uh, so this is actually kind of more akin to like a vampiric. Um, uh, oh, I just went blank on my word. Um, thrall, uh, vampiric. You know how like uh, in some vampiric mm-hmm. myth mythology, a vampire can create thralls and then control mm-hmm. them. That's kind of how I also read these ancients. Uh, I would, you know, that's kind of how I, I see that, uh, you see that a lot with, um, especially like Western vampire, vampire mythologies. Um, so, but basically the, the infestation, again, originally this was utilized by the Orkin to combat the sentience. Uh, however, the problem is, is the infestation has absolutely no prejudice as to who it attacks. Um, Basically, the only entities currently known to be truly immune to the plague are the Tenno, their Warframes, as well as the Sentience. And arguably, it's because the Sentience have had time to to become immune. Uh, because, again, this was also, I believe, one of the reasons that they lost their replication capabilities initially. Um, 
and the manner in which many of the infested refer to themselves actually do indicate that there is a hive mind of some sort controlling them, which goes back to that in-game description of like, <clears throat> you know, these individual, and again, kind of nodding to what Beard is saying about the connection to the flood. Individually, they're very like rabid, animalistic, not thinking. But then like when they get together and they, they you look at like the whole picture, these swarms actually have really weird signs of coordination. Oh, God. Now we're talking about techno Lovecraft. That's what this is essentially. I just disturbed by uh, well, the amount the amount of tentacles that showed up in our chat. Well, Gamertron is is talking about the thing that I wanted to kind of allude to to begin with, because like the infested ancients themselves very much give this like Cthulhu aspect to them. Oh uh, yeah, I can so, see that. Like, like having that as like an idea, it just makes me think that this is like the that they decided let's twist so many elements between like what uh like literature has and what sci fi has and make like some techno Lovecraftian Cthulhu esque race that is now <laughs> uh the infested. Because you've got elements of Siva as we've covered, we've got elements of uh of the flood and you definitely have mm-hmm. elements of like some eldritch uh oldness that's going on here. Which still calls back to a very large basis with Warframe being lodged in 4K lore or 40K mm-hmm. lore. You know, it's it's all built up of that old idea. Like I'm I'm looking at this going, oh, Dark Eldar. I'm yeah, just, actually, okay. the, dark, the Dark Eldar do make yeah. That's one of yeah. the things that we were kind of talking about in top three is that a lot of stories have been told. So how do you mm-hmm. create a story? that is unique in its own way. Well, Warframe does it, it seems like Warframe does it by taking a lot of the science fiction tropes that are really, really popular Mm -hmm. and just kind of classic tropes and then mashing it together with some intrigue and like um, psychological horror, as well as this immense um, kind of, there's always a mystery that you're chasing. It seems well at least especially once they started really diving into creating the lore there you didn't really know who you were you didn't know that the warframes were controlled by children you didn't know that for a long long time i'm gonna once, say a large majority of the story was all built up like after the game had even right. come out or at oh, least yeah. so we know so, well and it, yeah, it started was, it started with the that. the dlcs that you were talking about yeah and then mm-hmm. again again the sacrifice like Actually, in in reading a lot of these updates, I will be very honest. I'm glad that it took so long for Warframe to make the extra lore, because I'm the sure. sacrifice the sacrifice dropped in June. Because uh, mm-hmm. I remember they were they were pushing it pretty hard at Guardian Con actually, mm-hmm. um, and it was really I mean like it, it was really kind of cool to see you know them talking about that up on the stage, but also. In hindsight, looking back at how much of my summary notes come from people's the last couple of updates, yeah, people's interpretation of information from the sacrifice specifically, I'm actually very thankful that the sacrifice had. I mean, because the sacrifice, well, I, I mean, it just seems to have completely revolutionized the storytelling aspect of it. You also well, have and- to realize that the game is at this point five years old. And Mm -hmm. when it first started, it was a sleeper game. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, same. I mean, again, going back to kind of the comments that we had at the beginning, I mean, I I view this very similar to the way the way the way that I see um, Path of Exile, which is also very Mm -hmm. similar in, you know, it's it's kind of that sleeper esque game. You know, it's it's very cult following, but not super popular. Yeah. I'm going to say games like these traditionally do not garner a lot of interest until they get the chance to really Mm -hmm. build up. I Mm -hmm. will once again, per usual, per always, go back to World of Warcraft as one of the worst on that angle. Because as much as the Warcraft, uh, I mean, even uh, uh, world as like a, as a whole, like, the original Warcraft RTS games and everything had some very good lore behind them and so on, but they were niche titles. World of Warcraft opened it up to a more expansive uh, amount of people that could start to really dig into them, but it really didn't get its feet on the ground until, like, 
pretty well expansion three with uh, the the Wrath of the Lich King, mm-hmm. and even like mm-hmm. Burning Crusade had some problems, so on and so forth. And this is even coming from an established story that Blizzard already had put in place. Now, oh, War, well, they Warcraft changed they changed the story up, a ton of thing a ton of times with Warcraft. I mean. Well, don't even get me started on how many times they've actually retconned it, because I will use retcon as a negative in terms of World of Warcraft, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, the amount of times that they've actually gone back and said, well, we've got to bring back that character somehow, <laughs> and it's like a complete mulligan to what you just did in, <laughs> like, two expansions back for, for no good reason. Well, that's uh, so other cool. than Other than we just want to bring this character back because it makes us some extra money. Well, that's the whole problem with having a franchise that's so old. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, and also the, it's it's a hundred percent MMO. Is, hey, right. it's, oh, yeah, at this point, wow, it's just a, a really old franchise. If we're going to talk about franchises that have lasted, that one has probably lasted. Would you say that's like the longest running uh, PC franchise that we have at this point? Because I can't uh, think of one that's even uh... longer. It's one of it's them. It's one of them. I yeah. I would say that it's not the only one. I, I mean, I guess from an MMO. Yeah, for for an there's MMO, Baldur's Gate, it is one of the yeah. But like you, you've got Baldur's Gate, you've got RuneScape, you've got, got Diablo. Diablo, which is arguably longer at this point. And some of those have some very Blizzard tie-ins and so on. So oh, in God. terms of like build up and so excuse me, so on. Like yes, these. These titles are are older and they are developed and they are, there are a lot of stories that they've already told over and over again and now they have to rehash because they almost don't seem like they've got an original bone in their body anymore. Uh, and we can argue that night and day, you know, it, as, in terms of like how it is that it, that it all falls back on it. And, and this still does tie back with Warframe entirely. I know we kind of got like sidetracked on this one a little bit, but with Warframe... Uh, taking the time to like establish what it is that they've wanted uh they're going in a way that i can appreciate uh in in terms of like they're developing their story on the side it feels like until up up until recently uh putting in little bits and pieces and then seemingly building off of what the uh the overall hype has been around the community that has fostered theories and ideas and actually turned them into something, you know, big or important or otherwise, Mm -hmm. uh, or, or making them fit into what they would hope to see. Uh, I hear it all the time from, uh, the Warframe community that a lot of times they listen to what theorists talk about, and then they go along with what the theorists talk about which in that regard makes me go, well, they just dropped the line and then they just said, well, we'll go with this. This sounds like mm-hmm. a good one, which is fine all the same. Like, I'm not I'm not putting that idea down. It definitely it, gives a different approach to the writing style and the overarching well, development and it, of the story. It I mean, develops the, the thing, thing is, though, is that the yeah, at the end of the day, though, the, the challenge is going to be when it when it comes down to time wise, how consistent do they keep it? You know, that's that's and my that's, biggest thing. That's the biggest question that I'm kind of going to have, because at one point or another, they're they're going to need to step up. And this is my major complaint right now, I think, when it comes to, like, trying to finagle the story, make sense of it and really care for it. Uh, they need to basically give more for themselves, if you will, to just like develop off of their own ideas Mm -hmm. and take the chances to flip flop back over from like what the community was talking about. And all of a sudden surprise, it was something completely different. Uh, Do not make me quote that freaking Tolan card from, from destiny (laughs) ever again, because the amount of times that I've had the ability to quote that card when it comes to proving us wrong in terms of how things were set up is incredible. That gives you an idea of the, the type of different storytelling that I am into versus what it feels like Warframe is going for, which is very much a community-based and community-involved story, uh, which, again, there is nothing wrong with that. But it does not garner interest in terms of longevity in my mind. Well, and I think that ties, too, into, like I was saying at the beginning, with the, the idea of the synthesis. 
like how yeah. that's how that's tied into the community revealing you know finding finding the the hints and and uncovering mm-hmm. it as a as a whole i think that is really ultimately where i think a lot of the hype from warframe has stemmed from is that that um loyalty i guess mm-hmm. maybe i don't mm-hmm. know if that would be the right word for it but the the it's, the it's transparency you could use the, with the it. transparency <laughs> Yeah, the transparency of the uh, the way that they are create they're co creating the story. They're not mm-hmm. creating the story and then asking people to just you know accept it. They actually are co creating it, which is I mean as as a as far as like a game development standpoint, that it's I'd kind of find that actually really interesting. But again, I I think the challenge is going to be you know year four, year five, year six, you know year ten. If they're still around, they're going to have to start actually kind of being like, no, that's nice, but that's not the, you know, that's not the story. And that's, be that's going to be a... to see how much they, well, is, are, okay, so it's, are they letting them develop the individual stories of each of the ten, Tenno. like, specifics? Or are they, oh, are they controlling the overarching thing? Because if the overarching thing is this big that's idea fair. that they have that's fair and yeah. they're just controlling the smaller things it's you could still have all these side quests essentially yep. well and that kind of ties back into the happen. that ties back into the different warframes right you know each mm-hmm. there's there's uh i think like 35 warframes currently that people can play as and each there's one has yeah there's so there's a lot of frames and i know there's like 20 ish i think 20 20 21 primes right now um, hmm. And one of them actually was the cause of the server crash that they had in uh, July <laughs> was because um, Ash Prime, Ash Prime was yep. the uh, the Warframe that they uh, announced during Tinocon. Uh, yep. And the requirement was, what was it? The initial requirement was you had to be in stream for 30 minutes i think was what the the original requirement and then they would like gift oh, your they would grant your well because you know they were on twitch so they were like we'll right. grant your we'll grant your um linked account. account your linked account to prime uh the prime well that's what result that was the the cause of the huge crash that happened they had so many people show up that the servers literally couldn't take it and so yeah. because they they basically broke the system they uh in turn that's now why to get ash prime i think it's if you were i think if you have an active uh active account playing warframe between i I can't remember the dates exactly but they changed it to say if you if you played between these two dates uh you get an ash prime and the the reason was is because it, it broke it so bad that they couldn't see who was logged in yeah. Like, it was just like I oh my gosh it was it was actually I was really impressed by that like that was really and I think that again kind of ties into beard what you're talking about too is that kind of that community they they they're pushing really hard for a community involved story which I think is really cool mm-hmm. but you know it, it does it also has some costs that i I, i'm curious i'm actually legitimately curious i'm not i'm not cynical i'm curious as to how they're going to pull it off and don't don't mishear me i think they are going to pull it off Mm -hmm. but i i'm just i'm curious how they are because this could you know this could easily become a uh a bit of a revolutionary format a revolutionary format And, and you know to be honest when my only problem with warframe is the mechanics that's very that's very cool because mechanics mechanics can change <laughs> like that's 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 not a that's not a deal you know there's different mechanics in different games all over the place well i'm going to say and considering i'm i'm so used to storytelling being here's a company that's going to a, a company a presenter a story writer storyteller etc that is giving me a story that i'm able to digest understand and pull pieces from Mm-hmm. And I, I, in my position of creating content for uh, Destiny, Monster Hunter, and a couple other titles off and on, I've been in the position where I feel I've had some influence in possibly how things could go, 
or at least ways that people could like sit and think about or bugs in people's ears for like how they could consider how to take a story. Mm -hmm. But I don't see it to the degree that I would say with how Warframe has interacted with its community in that regard. So it is a very different way for how the story is being presented and told instead of it's very much an experiment. Granted, Warframe itself has been kind of an experiment from day Mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I would like to think from like... I, I wanted to get into it from, from moment one when I played it on the PS4. Again, headaches kind of persisted on that one, and that was a problem. It got better on PC, but it just, uh, I, I I still just could not do it. But anyway, before I get into that again, the whole idea, though, with just the community involvement in the story, I've liked. And at the same time, I've hated, because I've already <laughs> seen all of the exposure that like you and I have already blew, like we've already been nailing at it this entire uh, episode when I have chimed in, like, oh yeah, the infested, it's just the the flood with these elements that are added in with it. And it's just like, I, I, I can't help but think that so many people's imaginations or ideas of these races and the species that they have come up with and the instances that you are now in Warframe haven't been in some way contaminated by the fact that the community is going, well, make this Halo or make this Destiny or make this Monster Hunter just to give you an idea or example of like, here's a big game. Why can't you make something really fit with it and Mm -hmm. really bring that to Warframe and really amplify it? And then they do, and it's played for a little while, and then it's put down again for a feature that people were clamoring for, and now they no longer do. And the same happens with story, too. Like, I, I go ahead and I look at, uh, you know, well, this really sounds like something from, from Warhammer from, like, 20 years ago. And I can't help but wonder that all of these people, all these ideas that we have had for, for so long that uh, basically do fall back into, uh, you know, contaminating the story and events that could happen with Warframe. That could be a genuinely different experience if it were not for the community. That's right. my and I guess, worry in it whole. Right. And I, and I totally, I totally hear that. But I guess my, my challenge to that is, is it really contaminating the story or is it just giving it a flavor? <sighs> You, do you, I mean, you, you, right? Do you see what I'm saying? I, I see the counterpoint. I just don't agree with it. Like, right. That's, okay. And that's, that's my, and that's, my, that's a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent fair. That I mean, sounds like a good let's chat. Oh, yeah. definitely. Like I mean, it, that, that just comes down to like contamination of stories in general. Well, it's like the question of when can... does, when does imitation cease to be flattery? Right. And, and for me, I think that's where part of my issue with, you know, Warframe as a whole kind of is. And I know that there are elements of, of Destiny that kind of grab from it, but I would hate to say that Destiny's overarching internal story with the Grimoire and otherwise is a, a lot more original than some of the other stuff I've read over the years, but it's a lot more original than some of the other stuff I've read over the years. Right, and I think the, the other challenge, too, is, like, I see, when I see in Warframe's community, like, driven stuff is more of like a, a harkening back to like old school RPGs where you mm-hmm. as a as a DM, you know, you you set out the framework and this uh, this kind of goes into I think what Green was saying earlier um about, you know, what is what aspect is actually being controlled. Uh because like a, yeah. a good a good DM in D&D, for example, you know, this is kind of getting off topic, but let's go with it. A good DM in D&D um will set the framework of the world and then let the players choose what they want. You know, right. it's it's one of the longest standing jokes that DMs will spend like hours prepping a campaign and a player will find the one caveat that they were like, OK, that's going to be 30 seconds of interest and we're going to move on and build an entire campaign based off this stupid NPC that should have never been in the game to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's just and, and some of those things is like the thing is, is like as playing one of those characters who who pissed off the DM by doing exactly that. 
those are some of the funnest games and funnest stories that I have from my memories of, you know, playing D and D or playing, right. you know, white wolf or any, any of the take, take any tabletop game. Um, those, those quote unquote, you know, stupid side quests that, that we decided, you know what, it's not going to be a side quest. This is going to be our main mission. And, you know, it made no sense. And we turned it into this epic campaign that lasted for, I mean, we, we had, we have had one campaign that's lasted for years and it was all based <laughs> off this stupid thing that we did. So like, I mean, that's where, where I, I totally see your point because I've also been on the other side as a DM and had them, you know, have, it's, it's like, so it's frustrating. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I love, I love, there was a joke that I saw on Twitter the other day. It's like being a DM is kind of like buying a, 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 buying a pack of cats, like the super expensive cat house. And then the, the SOB spend the entire time playing in the cardboard box that it comes with and yeah. ignore the entire house. Like that mm-hmm. is, that is so accurate. But mm-hmm. I think that's also kind of a testament to, you know, what I kind of pick up with on the philosophy of um, of the Warframe community is like they are kind of, you know, again, going into this like idea of this like testing concept that they're trying this out, which actually really kind of excites me because if they pull it off, if they show that this is actually really popular, I mean, that that's kind of a cool function. That's kind of a cool feature to um to have in game development is it an increased involvement of the community you know it's one of the things with destiny that we've always pushed let's well, so one of okay to a lesser extent we've been able to contr- not necessarily control aspects of destiny but we've definitely had influence on some of the story in some ways or at least it feels like we have because of some of the theories that we've come up with Mm-hmm. Or at There's, least ask for clarification or something. Right. There's the no least. way that you can have a theory or a community this active in a lore where also you know that there are writers who dive into our Discord or follow you on Twitter or dive into other lore discords. They see what you're talking about, and there's mm-hmm. no way that it cannot influence. So the fact that Warframe has just taken it to a different level. Will be interesting to see if they could pull it off. Mm-hmm. Right, and I th- and I think I think it also are... is just they're a little bit more transparent about it too. You know, mm. yeah. I mean, it might. I mean, and and that's that's me speaking from not you know not really but. ever being a game developer, a game story developer. But you know, this could be something actually that goes on quite a bit behind the scenes, and we're just not right. you know we're just not aware of it. And this is just something, like I said, this would be a really good let's I, chat I agree. topic for sure to talk about how companies may develop story or just or in general possible. story development. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm going to say and to, to the flip of all of this too, I just feel like Warframe has more potential to say it was all a simulation a lot more than what I've seen. Nah, on, no on Man's Sky has got him beat. Well, all right, you got it. You got me there. <laughs> I, read, I read. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! I read the the so they posted a new put an article about that, and they were like mm-hmm. the people writing the article were so pissed, and I'm like, yeah, but they said it from the beginning that that's what it was. That's what it was, right? Oh, uh, but no, oh. yeah. Well, and I think again, I I, I just really like I I just I'm I'm kind of enamored by this idea that they're you know that they're playing with. I think that's a really mm-hmm. cool cool concept. Is ultimately where I was going with that. Yeah, no, I I agree entirely. I, per usual, my my curse or my 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 blessing, whichever you would want to look at it as, I see it from both sides and. Unfortunately, being partially more of a cynic, I see it more from the the bad mm-hmm. angle of how of how people and especially fans get their hands into something. I might be jaded because I see how how some influence the destiny community and how little they they seem to actually understand what they're talking about at times uh and how i how that influences something of that nature that's what worries me on that angle i have seen how gamers grow up in that regard and how some that that complain the loudest shouldn't be heard the most and that's a fair that's a fair i i will i will give you that as a fair statement but anyway i think i've bashed on uh on everything 
at this point. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Um, do you guys, do we have, oh, wait, we need to talk about the Cephalons real quick. I, was say, I think, I think green had to roll here, but okay. Uh, real quick to wrap it up with Cephalons. Cephalons are basically, uh, so not to trigger beard anymore, but they're basically smart AIs from Halo. Um, they're basically Sigh. artificial. <laughs> So Cephalons are artificial intelligent constructs, um, at, which at their core are basically dedicated to completing tasks, uh, whether that was a task that was assigned to them or that they chose for themselves. Now, it doesn't really seem to matter too much as long as they have a task to work towards. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes, and actually due to not possessing any physical form of their own, they often will generate a what's what they refer to as a visual representation or visual interpretation of themselves when they interact with organic life forms if that uh, interaction is required to complete their task. Uh, the constructs are actually have known to been existed since the time of the Orkin Empire, uh, the corpus are actually very commonly seen using them to self-regulate their ships. And uh, similar to conventional programs, a cephalon can be replicated, actually, and copied throughout numerous systems. And while there might there there might be nuanced differences between the copies of the cephalon, the majority of these copies are very identical in terms of personality, though they might have different tasks. Uh, so it actually was revealed, however, in the webcomic, uh, which is, again, we kind of were talking about that at closer to the beginning. Uh, what remains, actually, is the webcomic's name. <clears throat> it was revealed that many of the Cephalons, had, uh, while believed to have been created during the Orican Empire, this was actually not accurate. The Cephalons were found and, uh, quote, chained. Uh, and they were basically minds of human individuals that were turned into digital intelligences after their deaths, though it is actually unknown whether or not this was a voluntary process or if they were forced, because within the webcomic What Remains, we actually have the origin of um, two Cephalons. Uh, Cephalon Suda, who was a scholar who chose to become a Cephalon, and then Cephalon Ortis, which most people will recognize because Ortis is actually the Cephalon that pilots and controls your Warframe ship, um, who was a warrior who was actually forcefully created uh, as a Cephalon, and who his personality was edited to make him more tame and caring, which is kind of a ironic little twist on his person. He was basically... Um, neutered i guess would be the most accurate word uh to do stuff so uh and that's where cephalon samaris which we kind of were talking about at the beginning with the uh, synthesis and the the uh, sanctuary uh come in comes into the picture uh cephalon he he is a cephalon that is identified self-identified as a seeker of knowledge um, and basically his task or his goal is to immortalize the universe through the process known as synthesis and that process is what basically you encounter beings and then it deconstructs that being into a data stream that <laughs> chat uh, the D uh, sorry, that was really funny deconstructs the uh, being into data that basically allows um, Samaris to store it within the sanctuary, which again, we kind of talked about that there at the beginning about how that's a uh, basically a codex on steroids. Um. Bop, bop, bop. I believe that's really just a, a good place to kind of stop with the Cephalons. Cephalons have, like, it, it's really actually kind of an interesting piece. Um, similar to Halo and the Smart AIs, I'm also really interested in them, too. So it's not really a surprise that Cephalons are of interest to me. But, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's actually a good place to stop as far as, like, a, a summary introduction to the lore of Warframe um, simply because it gets really crazy and convoluted. Um, I'm going to say we really didn't. Uh, I know we talked on some like early points into the story and everything, but otherwise like there's still, there's still plenty to divulge there. Like just the basic understanding of the factions is just kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, for like what's going on in the system. Which I do again, kind of like. 
Yeah, um, no, yeah. Oh my gosh, I had I had a ton of fun, like mm-hmm. re- looking up all the stuff on this one. Uh, it was it was really cool. Again, it was really cool just looking through the the community wiki because mm-hmm. again, I just it was like it was really well done, just a really well I put together think, site. I think they run into the same problem that uh, Destiny does occasionally, though, with its storytelling with the uh, the character side of things. Oh they, yeah, yeah. They run into like not giving me a reason to care about them too much individually. Mm-hmm. Like I, I like the faction, but as soon as you're like, yeah, it's Captain Vor. He's mm-hmm. the first guy you fight. I'm like, so he's the first boss I kill. Yeah, pretty, and yeah. I don't really see too much of after that point, and isn't a very developed character after that point until you give me the story in Second Dream and so on. Okay, that's fine. You know, that's I think the thing that they really should fix a little bit more on and just to divulge a little bit further i i think that would do them a lot of good in in terms of allowing me to care for the characters even if they are like like the joker let's be honest here for a second i love the joker because he is a villain that you love to hate make me love and love to hate the villains just as much as the actual characters yeah no that's and that's a fair point i mean and i think well, in, in in defense of Warframe, right? You know, they're not the only game to have that problem. Mm-mm. No, I, I I just feel where where they're taking, as we've highlighted so heavily here, such a community outreach in terms of the story and so on. I'm sure that plenty of people have otherwise written up theories and ideas on these characters that they could easily look back and divulge into, and then mm. make them canic- uh, canonical. You know, that's the the openness that they could easily go ahead and take in that in that regard, even if it's just bits and pieces to give them some more human-esque ideas behind them. And I use human very loosely, but just to give them some more background. And I think that would do them a lot of good and a lot of favors to to interest people like me. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they do, I think that would go a very long way because it would touch on the one piece of the story that I think they're. The one of the two pieces that I think they're really missing, between, because again, I think the world building is uh, is still kind of harsh, I guess. Right, and I think I mean to be fair too, uh, I know the beta was released what 2013. So, mm-hmm. but like the big story, I mean, and I, I mean, I, I guess ultimately to be fair, uh, you know, Destiny comparing it to Destiny, Destiny faced similar issues. Not not maybe the same necessarily flavor, but they were similar mm-hmm. issues with its story at the initial, you know, arguably at the initial part. Um, and so, you know, given the given the increase that they've released with the sacrifice uh, and, you know, Second Dream and all all those those hot fixes that they've been putting out. I mean, again, I I. I'm not a fan of the game mechanics, uh, so you won't see me playing it, but this is definitely a story uh, plot that I could see, you know, following just from a, from an interest on, like, how they're going to pull stuff off. I definitely would be interested mm-hmm. in watching that. Yep, I could see. <clears throat> so, that being all said, um, real quick, let's just run through a couple shout-outs. Uh, Green had to take off real quick. Uh, she had a uh, sudden... Sun emergency that she had to take care of. Everything's okay, but she just had to jump off. Um, so we will see her. We will get her next week. Um, real quick, I wanted to give a big shout out to Kev Ronamanon. Uh, first off, thank you for putting the pronunciation of your name as your name that you communicated with. I really actually appreciate that because um, I just really appreciate it. And then also, this is the this is the individual who actually did the video on the uh, clarification of Atheon's pronunciation in Destiny Two, and so uh, he actually sent in another video from Zer from Destiny One uh, that he uh, he said might be a tie into Destiny Two because you know everyone loves everyone loves Tentacle Face, um, so I'm going to be watching that as soon as I possibly can. It's been kind of my my schedule outside of basically this this evening has been kind of crazy. Um, but I will get, get a, a view of that in as soon as possible so that I can give you my thoughts on it. Um, but yeah, big shout out. Uh, thank you again for, 
for that. Uh, we appreciate your due diligence on the pronunciation. Obviously, you care very closely or care very dearly, dearly about careful pronunciation as you have made sure that I pronounce your, your name correctly. Um, so we appreciate that. Uh, and then my, that's pretty much my shout outs, actually. Uh, Beard, what about what do you have for us this week? Mm, I don't really have too much other than uh, if anybody from the Warframe community happens to hear this and you don't know who I am, uh, please don't crucify me. <laughs> uh, it is not a matter that I hate your game. I very much love the idea of ninjas in space. Uh, it is just a matter that I really don't dig your game. So it's a difference between not digging and just uh, it, and hate. There is a big line there. Uh, that being said, uh, I I really just want everybody to play what they want to play, enjoy what they want to enjoy, uh, and leave me do the same. Okay, thanks. That is all. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then the other thing is too, kind of to to tie off on that that comment too is there is nothing wrong with enjoying a game's story, but not no. liking to play it. You Dude, know, okay. Let me. Let I mean, me just right. Go but off but on I mean, this just just put it. I mean, right, right. I mean, we can agree yeah, with that. But but let me let me go off on this tangent for a second here, like for for a little while. The Force Unleashed. It it's its story was what kind of hooked me because it was like mm-hmm. in the middle of everything, and I was like, oh yeah, this is really cool. Its gameplay was atrocious. <laughs> What? It no, was probably, it was amazing. Yeah, no, it, no, it, it, it was, was really probably bad. some of the worst lock <laughs> on and oh, it was god awful. But it Hey, Star Killer was a BA though. Oh, he was a bamp. Like there is no other way to say it. He was a bamp. Uh, but in that respect, like it's the it like that was a guilty pleasure game for me, just the mm-hmm. same. And I would seriously count like as much as it has grown into something more for me, like Destiny also kind of was a was a guilty pleasure game for me too because I can once again understand that it is a very flawed game. Most of the games, spoiler alert, that I have played in my life are very flawed games. Most of the games that are produced and put on a shelf are flawed games. What? And I think that is about where I can leave that point. Well, so once that's again, also you're also talking to you're also talking generational expectations too there too, because oh, you know, know like, like I mean ugh. I mean I I mean well and you and I are both kind of the same similar boat there is like you know I remember you get you get the game and mm-hmm. you get the game like mm-hmm. that's the game like if there's a bug yeah. in it if there's a bug in it most of the time people viewed it as Easter eggs oh like, yeah you know like there there was that and so. Then you you turn around and you're like, oh, this game's not, you know, this game's graphics are wah wah wah, and it's like, well, okay, <laughs> it's so I think I think there's also a, a difference in expectation as far as like what it quote unquote is a finished product as well. Well, especially in the Fortnite generation, right? Well, and that's that's kind of what I mean is like in a in a in a generation in which games are online all the time you know and patches you know i mean destiny destiny is a clear clear example of this you know we get weekly basically weekly patches behind the scenes which is i mean from a for me as a gamer is just like mind-boggling that oh yeah that we get that um so there's there's that to see some of the the the, like coming from uh final fantasy 11 on ps2 where I was lucky on the PS2 if I saw an update like once every other month. And that was just for like patches and some bug fixes. PC saw them all the time. But what Square Enix had to go through to go through the PS2 to get them onto it was insane. Mm-hmm. And that was talking that they had direct connection with their servers, but they still had to go through Sony to do so. The fact that everything is pretty well going more direct as as it is is nuts. Given, of course, that we still don't have like dedicated servers for a lot of these titles, but given that either cybersecurity or a bunch of other stuff is so important anymore, to see games updated like they are is incredible to me. 
And I never would have thought that I would have had that in near my lifetime with the way that like games started as and the way that they needed to be like either patched or remastered to make them work properly in terms of like how they were put up. I didn't I didn't have to like think about that crap. I was playing freaking Battlezone on Atari back in the day. Like that was <laughs> I was playing was one of my first games. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, like it's like Smash Brothers on N sixty four. Smash Brothers yeah, on really. N sixty four. We didn't have we didn't have patch updates. We didn't have you know no. new characters or whatever. And so that's I think that's that's also kind of the other cool thing and also thing to keep in mind too is like the difference in that that whole aspect. But but that yeah. sounds like another no, let's it, chat topic. I I I think we could have plenty of those when it comes down to the industry and the communities as holes behind them with mm-hmm. the the outrage that is supplied by them that realistically has no need to be there. Let's just be <laughs> frank there for for a couple seconds. Um so yes, once again this entire topic came off of the idea of Warframe uh lovers, please do not crucify me for <laughs> not exactly liking your game. Uh but that being said, you can go and enjoy it all you want. Just don't don't try to as, yeah, just as be I just be hearing... just be equally open that you know yeah. as much as you don't enjoy some games, some people might not enjoy the game that you enjoy. Yeah. That's, just, I mean, as, that's just it. That's just it. As as, as much as I uh, as I sit back and hear the term, don't be a Tenno's witness. <laughs> and on that note, we're gonna take off. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to run through an outro. We'll probably stay for a little bit of an after show. That will begin to wrap the chat up. Thank you again to those over on Twitch for coming to spend your evening with us. If you'd like to join us for the live streaming of the episodes, please be sure to give us a follow over on twitch.tv slash focusfirechat. Links to our episode archives can be found at www.focusfirechat.com. Please be sure to email us at focusfirechat at gmail.com with any comments or questions for our team concerning the podcast and let us know how we're doing by giving us some feedback and a rating over on iTunes as well. Also, be sure to check out all of our amazing partner podcasts within the Guardian Radio Network over on theguardiansofdestiny.com. So until next time, focus your fire and may your light shine bright. <laughs>